Nice. Hey, everybody. Welcome to CX Day. I'm here with my uh, partner, Matt. What's up, Matt? How are you doing? I'm great. Happy to be here, Pat. It's going to be a fun day. This is going to be a super fun day. We've been looking forward to this and planning it for a very long time. This is a partnership sort of hosted event between us at SPI Media. And you're going to hear from not just Matt and myself, but you're going to hear from our CX director, Jillian Benbow, as well at the end of the day. But we're also partnering with Circle here. Circle is the platform we use to host our platform. And it's just been so fun to over the last couple of years. And we'll get into the history of how SPI Pro is created and, and what it all entails and how you might pull information and also inspiration from us to build your own community whether you have a community already or not, this is going to be super handy. But Circle and the team, Andy and Alexis, are going to be presenting at uh, noon Pacific today. Uh, so in a few hours. Are we going to go for three straight hours? No. Give us the plan, Matt, in terms of what people can expect in terms of timing here. And we'll dive right in. Yeah, we're going to have a lot of fun today. Uh, we have three distinct workshops. Uh, Pat and I are thrilled to, to anchor this at the start. Uh, so we'll go for about 45 minutes in terms of the, uh, the great stuff that we've prepared uh, and have some time at the back end to have a more maybe open-ended conversation, try to take some questions. Then we'll take a break, uh, allow everyone maybe to get something to eat, you know, take a breather, check your email. And then that's when Andy and Alexis are going to come in and lead us through workshop number two. And I'm so excited for that. Um, and then on the heels of theirs, we'll have another break. Uh, you can, again, check your email again, uh, do, do a restroom break. And then, uh, Pat, you mentioned our amazing CX director, Jillian. She's going to lead uh, workshop number three. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's nice it's nice and spaced out, a lot of different content, really exploring this topic of community building from different vantage points and angles. And I think that's what's going to make today just extra special. You know, building a business and building online communities is about learning as you go and actually executing. And hopefully we can push forward a lot of our learnings, our wins and failures across the past couple of years. And one of those things uh, that was both a win and maybe a learning experience was our previous event called Audience Driven. And that was very successful. That was a lot of fun. However, it was like, I don't know, eight straight hours of stuff and it was a lot. So we decided, OK, let's focus on one of the most important topics that people had a lot of questions about, which is community. But let's also break up the day to give people breathing room and time to uh, decompress, but also implement some of the stuff as well. So that's going to be great. So let's go a little bit about, uh, let, let's go into uh, the schedule of what's going to happen. Again, our workshop today is going to be about audience building versus community building. Those are two separate things. We're going to go into the big differences and why that's important to understand. Then we're going to get into Andy and Alexis's presentation at noon a little bit later today. And that's going to be about how to set up your home uh, for your community on Circle if you'd like, and we highly recommend that. But wherever you set up shop, we want you to know exactly how to approach it. And they're gonna give you a lot of examples as far as uh, you know different communities that are already on Circle and using the platform very, very well. I'm pretty sure we're used as an example a few times in there too. Uh, and then finally, uh, we have the presentation from Jillian at the end of the day, where we're gonna go through your first 30 days after you launch your community and it should be a lot of fun. Uh, also, while we're here, let's say hello to a number of the amazing people here. We got Kathy Young in the house, Laura, Amol, net friending with April Roga. April and Roy, welcome in. Thank you. Heather, Shell, this is going to be really fun. Uh, anyway, let's make this happen again. A little bit of introduction in the beginning to make way for maybe a little delay for people to come in, but I think we're about ready to go. So let's go into who we are. So let's describe a little bit about we at SPI and what we do. Matt, I'll start with you since you are now the CEO of SPI Media. I founded it and am a creator there. But talk about SPI and why community? Uh, why are we talking about this right now? Absolutely. Uh, we, in, in the nature of our workshop today, thinking about audience plus you know, community building is this yin and yang kind of complement to the creator side and even the business side. So we will spend uh, a lot of today actually talking about the business aspects. And, and I take that on for us as a, as a company, because as, as we think about it in terms of the future of the creator economy and where things are going, um, and not just fads and trends, but really like what are people really galvanizing uh, or uh, uh, kind of drafting towards and, and what is the future of where we can build economic value for everyone, a real exchange of value. You know, communities at the center of our business model now. And we believe that even thinking for us in terms of like building a media company that helps to express that value and teach that value out to other creators that are inspired to do something uh, similar, right? And really try to capitalize on kind of where this market is going. And there's so much activity and opportunity now. You know, we are trying to lead by example always. And this is the new direction that, that we're taking uh, through almost everything that we're doing, you know, at Team SPI. That's right. And my name is Pat Flynn. Many of you know my story. And we're going to get into a little bit of the history 
of uh, like where things came from and whatnot and, and how we got here. But I'm just so grateful because community has definitely become the center of uh, what we've been doing and what we've been talking about lately. I'm just really excited about that. So why don't we just kind of move forward and let me take you into a lot of what we did to get here because it's going to be a lot of fun. So how did we get here? Well, let's talk about the history. Many of you know the Smart Passive Income blog. This started in 2008 after getting laid off from the architecture industry. And as many of you know, I was able to then build a website called Smart Passive Income. This is actually the first iteration. Let me know if you were here back in the day when you saw this version of it. As you can tell, messy start for sure. There were no graphics. I even had a picture of here with me holding a snowboard. I don't even snowboard very often. I had no idea what I was doing, but this is the kind of stuff that happens. You kind of get messy. You have to be a disaster before you become the master. And it took some time, but now our website looks amazing and we are helping tens of thousands of entrepreneurs every single day. Uh, within our community, online, through organic finding, through you know reaching out to other people and partnering like we're doing today with Circle. It's just been so much fun, but it's been more than a blog, obviously. Many of you know that I have a YouTube channel as well with nearly 350,000 subscribers. Here are some of our more popular videos, some videos being seen in the millions, main, many of them about passive income, others about presentations and podcasting as well, which is really neat. And of course, speaking of the podcast, let me know in the chat if you happen to be a listener of any of these podcasts. Some of these are already in existence. Some of them are also up and coming, by the way. But all of these are within the SPI sort of network. And uh, the podcast has been so, so amazing for sure. But beyond the podcast, right? And those things are being used for audience building. We have books. Let Go was published in 2013. My book, Will It Fly, was published in 2015, became a Wall Street Journal bestseller. And then in 2019, uh, in conjunction with our event, FlynnCon in San Diego, uh, super fans came out and this is one of my favorite pictures. It's Daryl Eves over at Vid Summit giving away a thousand copies to people who attended Vid Summit a couple of years ago. And that's Mr. Beast. Yes, Mr. Beast is actually holding super fans, which was pretty great, which is just so cool to see. I just still am sort of jazzed by that because I'm a big fan of his and, and his creation. And beyond that, of course, we also have courses. So this has been primarily uh, our revenue generation tool over the years, selling courses about things like affiliate marketing, email marketing, online courses, webinars, podcasting, uh, those who are just starting out, and even like advanced courses like Amped Up Podcasting there, as you can see. But very recently, we launched something brand new, and that's called SPI Pro. And this is our community. And it's been the most fun I've never heard feedback like what we've collected from inside the community as well. It is a premium community, it is a paid community. Communities don't have to be paid, but we wanted to create a safe space for entrepreneurs to come in. And you know, we have a lot of audience building opportunities, right? We have the blog, podcast, the video, books, and also courses to lay on top of that. Courses and community are very different, but we'll talk about those differences and how they can uniquely support each other as well. But this community that we've built is sort of like encompasses all of this, right? And this is what we're focusing on right now. And this is why we're here. We're here to talk about this. We've never had the kind of feedback like we've gotten from building SPI Pro. And Circle.so is the platform that we've been using to host that, which is really cool. And as we have been building the community, we've realized that these tools that we've put into place, and yes, social media is included in that for sure. These items all help support and grow each other. The blog and the podcast help grow the community. The community helps make the content stronger on the blog and the podcast and the video side. And it just becomes a snowball effect. And so we're seeing the community grow and grow and grow while we are also creating new content and getting inspired. In fact, we, if uh, you've heard the podcast recently, um, we have been sharing the microphone with many people in our community, right? On our Teaching Fridays, we've had people come in from the SPI Pro community to teach workshops to our public audience and what happens is those people go whoa these are these this is the kind of caliber of people in spi pro well let me look at, let me kind of research that so again they support each other which is really really cool also want to give a big shout out to jonathan and jillian who are in the chat as well from team spi to help support uh thank you for that and again this is why we're here today in hashtag cx day if you happen to be using this on social and so let's talk about it the seven, actually, it's actually six, uh, six vital differences between audience building and community building. And I want to tell you a quick story. So in 2013, I went to an event, and this was when I just started speaking, and I always knew that I wanted to bring my audience together in different ways. So going to this event, it was called FinCon. I don't know if you perhaps have heard of FinCon, the Financial Blogger Conference. But in 2013, I was there, and I said, you know what? After I speak, I want to rent a restaurant out, 
and bring all of my people there who happen to be there who know the brand and just have them, you know, meet them all and and and, and say hello. And, you know, I knew there were going to be pictures taken. A lot of that stuff gets shared on social, which is great. So that's great for business and stuff. But I wanted to just bring people together and say thank you. So we rented out like this joint and there were a ton of people there, as you can see. But what was re really interesting was that at the end of the night, you know, I did my best. It sort of felt like a wedding, only like two second conversations with a whole bunch of people. But at the end of the night, I remember there was one person in particular who I saw. Uh, her name was Jennifer on her name tag. And I was like, oh, Jennifer, I did, didn't get a chance to even see you this whole time or say hi. I apologize. And here's what she said to me. She said, Pat, I don't want you to take offense to this, but I didn't come here to see you. And at first I was like, oh, snap, that's kind of that's kind of harsh. But then she said, no, 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 Pat, I listen to your podcast every single day. I hear your voice all the time, but I never get a chance to meet people who are in my circle. And you've provided an opportunity to do that today. And I want to thank you for that. So I didn't want to waste my time talking to you, no offense, but I wanted to find other people who were like me. And I thought that was a really, really interesting point. And it kind of struck me and it's very memorable for me because again, it's not about me. And you as the content and community creator, it's actually not about you as well. It is about those who you're serving to be able to find and help each other. So first of all, the biggest difference is like the, ob the objectives are different. The objectives of what it is that we're creating when we're doing audience building and the purpose of that and the creation and the purpose of community. So let's dive into this a little bit. In audience building, right? Blogs, podcasts, videos, social, et cetera. People come to find content. When you think about how people consume content, the things that we create when building an audience, they're looking for information often. They are perhaps doing a search on Google. They are perhaps finding a link on another website and finding you in that manner. And they're looking for answers, right? When you do a search or you're looking for stuff, you don't really necessarily think about, okay, well, who am I connecting with or who's on the other end? It's mostly a solo experience, but that's what's happening. But on the community side of things, people are there for connection. People are there for belonging, right? And that's so, so important to understand. And I've often heard a lot of people say this. I don't know who first said it, but I absolutely love this quote. And that is lots of smart people said, people come for the content, but they stay for the community, right? Let me know if you've heard that before. I've heard that several times in my past, and it's so true. And we found this to be even more true recently with our event that happened in San Diego a couple years ago. People coming, yes, for the content, but having the best experiences in the hallway, getting to meet each other, building relationships. Uh, there's an example of another creator. His name is Leonhart. You can see him here. I've done a lot in the Pokemon space recently, so this is sort of top of mind to, uh, to me. Uh, Leonhart's been publishing information and content and entertaining people on the interwebs on YouTube uh, for like six or seven years now. And he's built this massive audience, as you can see, 1.6 million subscribers. He's in the Pokemon space, and that's cool. He's creating content a lot, and he's providing value there. But the community really comes from the experiences that he creates over time. And recently, he created this really cool thing called a 90s pop-up shop. In fact, he set up a store in an event space that looks like this. This is like what the card shops look like in the 90s. I don't know, Matt, if you've been to places uh, like this, but this is this is like this is so nostalgic to see, to see something like this. Uh, and then it brought so many people in the community. Thousands of people came in to purchase from the store and just meet each other. And yes... Leonhart was why they were there, but they also got to meet each other and stick around for each other, which was really awesome. Han says, people don't come for content, they come because they have a need they think the community can fill. I love that. So that takes us to the business models and the fact that the business models are different. So Matt, I'm gonna have you speak to this because this is sort of your expertise. Let's talk about business models and why they are important to understand when it comes to the differences between community and also audience building. It's a, a great segue from just that that orientation path that you're talking about around the ultimate purpose of audience building versus community building, where, you know, with with audience building, uh, you're, you're building obviously hopefully towards, you know, a really large following and potentially across different channels. And then it becomes an interesting question of like, how, how do we think about then monetizing that and, and turning this into a very sustainable business you know, for you, the creator? And there's very relevant ways of doing that. There's really long established ways of doing it that are very kind of audience first. Um, but it does remind me going all the way back, Pat talking about some of like the early days, you know, uh, 2008, 2010, you know, around, you know, this very classic phrase that your blog is not your business. And, and that phrase, I bet a lot of you have heard of that, uh, especially if you've been online uh, for a little bit like Pat and I, you know, that, you know, and, and you can replace the word blog with, you know, podcast or, or a lot of different uh, other kind of channel types. 
you know, is that you know, we have to think about that intersection point between the audience and then ultimately something that's going to generate the revenue to support yourself and hopefully continue to grow in a capacity where, you know, if you're not being able to put full time attention to your creator business, you know, you want to get there at some point. And then maybe when, you know, you've been able to establish that beachhead and now you're full time, you want to grow that further and be able to reinvest uh, back into that business. So, you know, with an audience uh, driven kind of business model, you think about potentially ads, uh, you know, on a podcast, uh, you think potentially just about maybe sponsorship deals that you're working with, you know, different brand partners or retailers, maybe merchandise. Um, you're thinking about different forms of ways of, again, thinking about the audience channels um, and again, putting business uh, mechanics kind of around that, right? Um, you know, very classically, there's, you know, PPC ads, you know, and different things that, again, you can do for, uh, on an audience side. And so much of this is about, you know, this attention factor. Um, and there's, it, it's increasingly, at least, at least for us at SPI and, and what we think about, I, and we think critically about it and what we talk about, and, and this is potentially you know, something of a spiky point of view, but you know the the attention game is getting harder. And I think we, you know, maybe to to a significant degree can can kind of rally around that notion, whether it's social media or even podcasting. Uh, and these are all very noble pursuits, but you know, just because of the way the world works, the internet, and just this explosion of more and more content, and it's not slowing down. Um, people are increasingly fracturing, you know, their attention across so many different channels, so many different creators, so many different businesses. So like that's, it's a bit of a rat race, right? And, and you have to do that, that. That's a part of the game. You can't, you can't completely not build an audience, but how do you then think about building the business and how much of your business are you going to stake in some of these, these business models uh, and revenue streams that are, you know, either 100% rooted or very strongly rooted in just the audience factor alone. And this stands apart from then thinking about community and, and how we think about, okay, in a very different capacity, how can we bring people together in different ways, shapes, and forms? And the way that we think about it is that, you know, it's almost a, a direct line item kind of comparison there. And you can see it on the slide is that it's really about retention. It's not about um, attention and just trying to get more and more people to subscribe you know, to the podcast or to the YouTube channel. Again, yes, we want that. But once we get people to really engage with us and engage with each other, uh, as Pat, you were mentioning previously, to really get to know each other, to be able to build relationships with one another mm -hmm. and to move from uh, an experience point that is very, a very solo endeavor and then into a more group oriented you know, endeavor, we care a ton about retention. Uh, and then this, again, uh, illustrates what we can think about critically in terms of like building a very well-structured and sustainable business model. These are subscriptions, you know, uh, and membership tiers uh, and platforms like Circle are phenomenal in our ability to then be able to do that very, very easily. Uh, we think about coaching programs um, and not just like one-on-one -on -one coaching programs, but, you know, small group coaching programs, private group coaching programs. How do we facilitate those? Well, also, you know, we can use community-oriented platforms like Circle to even facilitate, uh, you know, small group coaching practices. If, if you choose uh, to grow a coaching practice and you want a more community centric, you know, business model and, and experience for your students, you know, this would be a fantastic way to really embrace you know, a lot of the mechanics and the power of community. And you can use a platform like Circle to, to bring that to life. So it's, again, um, different ways to think about, you know, the longevity of your business, how you want to scale your business and build in a direction that you like you want to build in and don't end up building something that, gosh, maybe in a couple of years, like God, I built in the wrong direction and now I kind of have this thing. And, you know, it gets harder to pivot, you know, along the way sometimes. So um, for us at SPI, uh, we have a blended approach. Um, and even here as an example, you know, Nerd Fitness, uh, uh, which we both know, Pat and I, uh, Steve Cam over there, creator, friends of ours, Adam as well, um, you know, his business partner, they've gone through a very similar metamorphosis, you know, much like us on the SPI side in the earlier days, like we were very content centric, at least in terms of the business model that you highlight, like the courses and the other things that were kind of our key revenue drivers. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Steve and Adam, like they pursued Nerd Fitness in a very similar way. We kind of came up in the same era of like blogging and podcasting. Um, but then they started to hit a plateau and like, you know, that's not like a bad thing to say, like well, so many of us either in business or in life, you can like literally think about you know, maybe health and fitness. You know, plateaus are just like natural things you kind of, you know, happen along a growth journey. So, you know, they thought really critically and, and they were actually ahead of this uh, in terms of maybe kind of where the market's going. Um, they rethought their business model from the ground up and they went with the community centric approach. Uh, first and foremost, they started with coaching uh, and they started to offer one on one and small group coaching uh, on their own, even before some of the more modern technologies existed. And they also did offer uh, a fantastic thing that, that they've just recently rebooted. If, if anyone's a fan of nerd fitness and, and you haven't heard this news, um, they do something called nerd camp. 
So this is an actual community where like their fans have an opportunity to get together in person. They go to a camp where they get to do all these outdoor exercises and experiences and all these group activities. Um, they rent out this really awesome like cabin experience. Uh, I want to say maybe in Tennessee. Um, and that, that is like such a fantastic manifestation of community, right? Like bringing people together, shared experience. Um, it's obviously a commercial enterprise, like they, they charge for that. But this is now the center of their business and it's growing like crazy. And now that we're you know, at a safer point in the pandemic, like they just relaunched uh, Camp Nerd Fitness and um, it's already potentially sold out, but you'd, you'd have to check. So like, I just love the story of Nerd Fitness and how Steve and Adam have navigated that business. And there's kind of a parallel track there with, you know, Pat, how we've been thinking about, you know, the SPI journey and where that business is going. Yeah, for sure. I mean, definitely parallel. Steve and I almost started our businesses at the same time. And we're very much about just audience building, content creation, and monetizing it through courses and other things, books and whatnot. Steve's book is amazing as well. However, now the times are changing and the tides are changing. And we're going to talk about what some of those changes are in a little bit. Uh, but also, you know, the community aspect, it can happen in many different forms, right? You had mentioned uh, essentially what is adult camp, but with exercise put into it, which is just super neat. Uh, we have online communities, offline communities, small meetups, virtual events like what we have going on right now, um, pro more private ones like we do in SPI Pro. There's so many ways to go about it. But what's really cool is the experiences are definitely different, and that's what I want to chat about next. So let's go to here. Anybody familiar with this? I think we're all familiar with this. This is, of course, Super Mario Brothers. I have fond memories of this. I got my Nintendo right when it came out, uh, and then I just have been hooked on it since. Um, but the Super Mario Brothers game, if you've played this, it's a side-scrolling game. It's pretty much just kind of, you, you can only do certain things at a time. There isn't much movement, there isn't much layer to it, but you take this in levels, right? You start off and you start to understand a little bit about, okay, this is what the mushroom does, it kind of grows you, right? Uh, it, you become larger, Mario. Um, if you get the flower, you start uh, shooting fireballs, and then you get to the end of the level and you reach the flag, and okay, you've moved on to the next level. This is very much like how the content we create today, the experience, the user experience for somebody like this is like a video game like Super Mario Brothers. It's kind of, okay, take this course, then go here, or read this piece of content, then sign up to our email list and go here. It's very much that kind of experience, but it can still be fun. It can still be addicting, and many people are binge watching, binge listening, binge reading our content and whatnot. It can happen in the very same kind of way, which is really neat. But there's another game out there that maybe better describes what the user experience is like for us who are creating communities, and that would be a game like this. Any other uh, war? World of Warcraft uh, players out there. I actually had to delete this off my computer, Matt. I don't know if you got into this game, but if you haven't yet, don't, because it's going to suck you in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You, you did. Um, and it sucks you in for a few reasons, right? Like they, uh, been like any good video game, uh, implement the sort of small, quick wins up front kind of thing, and then you kind of unlock new levels, gain new experience points. But one of the huge benefits of this is the idea that people are here to not just like go on their own quest, but to join other guilds and to meet other people and actually interact and befriend people there's in fact marriages that happen between people who meet in games like this laura says taking me back right and this is the beauty of what it is that we do as, as as community creators we now have the tools like circle to be able to create these interactive experience that now have more than just a linear passage but there's so many different dynamic opportunities to happen not just between yourself as the creator and your audience but your audience with each other. And that's really where magic happens in the brand is where community comes to play. So the experiences kind of differ in many different ways. Let's talk about learning and the differences between learning from a consumer's point of view and from a audience member and an uh, audience member and then also a, a community member. So let's talk about the consumer, right? A person reading or watching or listening to you. The feeling of consumption of your stuff is pretty on their own, right? It's like kind of solo. You're kind of doing it on their own. And yes, you might have the opportunity to share stories from others which make them feel a little bit more connected as you are sharing maybe testimonials or case studies. But the feeling is kind of like, well, I'm kind of on my own doing this and they're just consuming a guide and it's really up to them to execute on that thing and hopefully you're motivating them enough to do that. But when it comes to memberships, members of your communities, the feeling is like they're a part of something. And I feel like you've all sensed this before, right? When you feel like you're actually a part of a movement or a part of a group of people who all believe in something, who share the same values, who are trying to achieve the same goals, and you're with people like you, right? That's the feeling. I'm with people like me. Overdrink says, any dark elves in the house? I was, I was in the horde 
I was in the horde. Anyway, uh, and then you're being guided, right? Or you are guiding and helping others. And what's neat about the community, what we've found to be really amazing is that when you create this sort of private community, right? I mean, Facebook communities, LinkedIn communities are semi-private, if you will, uh, and you can obviously change the sort of credentials there. But with our private community at Circle, we found that people feel very safe about speaking up. People feel very safe about uh, you know being vulnerable. Can you speak to that a little bit, Matt? Because that is something profound that happens when you create a space to have people open up and, and not just like ask deep questions, but also share deep experiences and insights to help the group as a whole. It's profound and I dare say like increasingly table stakes. If you really want to create a, a genuine community, if you want that community to work, and by work, I mean, as points we've already started to explore around retention, mm -hmm. getting people to not only join, but stay and engage and share, and then have that start to generate the network effect that we all want, right? You you have to, as the creator, create guidelines and guardrails to th that foster that safety. Right. Uh, you want to be able to lead by example. So you yourself will have to potentially work towards even more vulnerability yourself to show up in that space mm -hmm. and share your own journey more, maybe in a way that you're not going to share on your podcast. Uh, but, you know, in your community, you should. Right. Or, or at least explore that thinking more. And, and we do that with SPI Pro uh, really from day one. Um, it's probably even a, a great plug for Jillian's. Uh, workshop later in the day, uh, which is very focused on the first 30 days of that experience for a new member so that the new members are immediately invited in very approachable, very kind of cookie crumb ways or bread, breadcrumb ways to like take small steps, right? To start to share, to start to explore, to start to meet one another one-on-one, -on -one, right? These are the things that when we talk about community experience, you know, with emphasis, uh, uh, on the experience side, right? And, and that's what we at SPI, that's why we don't just call it like community, you know, you know in the industry and, and Pat, you know, I know that you're talking with a lot of other creators just about like community, community building. Mm -hmm. We're trying to take even a stronger approach and say, no, it's not just community. It's about the experiences that matter the most. So our team internally and why Jillian's like title is CX director and not just community director is we care so much about experience that we've sort of inserted that into our, our like our vocabulary. And for shorthand, we call it CX. So yeah, yeah it, it's about being able to create that space and then live that out yourself. Exactly. Hence CX day. It's not community building day or community business builders day. It is community experience day because when you create those experiences, you get that sort of Disney like touch point that uh, allows a person to then spend, you know, $4,000 on an annual pass or something. I don't know. Uh, maybe I am speaking from experience there. Anyway, let's go back to the computer. The user experience also changes as far as communication. And this is really key too, because the way that communication happens uh, influences like that experience, right? So as far as communication is concerned on the consumer point of view, comments, right? That's how people communicate comments or if they wanna get in contact with somebody, a, a contact form or perhaps uh, maybe email. And so it's pretty asynchronous. Uh, not that asynchronous is bad and community cannot be created with asynchronousity, but it doesn't really lend itself to those interactions that might happen in the hallways, right, between people, not just between you and your community, but your community with each other, that lend itself to that feeling of, wow, I'm with my people. When it comes to member point of view, as far as communication, it's not just comments, it's replies, it's threads, and of course, Circle has that opportunity to do that within within uh, the, their system, uh, but this is why community happens is because now we're having different conversations. And if you go to a real event, like a, an in-person event, right, you see threads and replies happening everywhere. Yet on our blogs, on our content, even within our courses often, it just feels very kind of comment box, right? Like you go to the restaurant, you sign the little thing about the thing that you need help with, you put it in the box, and I think they just go to the shredder, to be honest, like right after that. Anyway, conversations are the new comments. Let me say that. That's that's a, a, a quote that I'm coining right now. Conversations are the new comments. The transformation that your audience goes through, right? Yes, audience building, they can transform absolutely through your courses, through your content, free and paid. But the transformation that happens because of the community is a little bit different, right? So from a consumer's point of view, it's, hey, I've learned something new. And then they collect that information, they use it, and then they kind of move on. And hopefully they subscribe so they get the next thing the next time, right? They, they're almost like 
content collectors in a way, our subscribers, right? They're just collecting our content. They're just sitting in the inbox. It is something that they can collect and then use or, or, or offer to somebody else, share, et cetera. But it doesn't really lend itself to transformation like a community does where, yes, there is learning that can still happen and learning does happen, but there's a feeling of connection, right? And the sense of belonging. Somebody mentioned earlier this idea that we're, 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 we're giving experiences so people can feel like they belong and that they're involved. And when they're involved, they can invest and they are invested in what it is that you're doing together. They'll, they'll stand up, they'll fight for the community, right? And they'll let you know when something's also not going the right way. And that's a, another benefit of this is these are the people who are gonna be the most uh, vocal about ways that you can improve your brand both constructively and just uh, positive feedback with what's already happening. Uh, the accountability and support that can happen here. No longer is a person kind of on their own, they're with each other and that is so huge, right? This is this is the community part of it. Uh, and then they have confidence and spirit because they're gaining that motivation and inspiration from others who are perhaps just a few steps ahead of them or who are guiding them in a way. And then the memorable, uh, memorable moments that happen over time from that, right? And in communities, what's really nice is that when goals are hit, new goals are ready to go, right? People are fired up about moving on to the next level and finding other people like them who are ready to move on to the next level, which is really cool. So the user experience is completely different and that's really important because the user experience, especially today, it's almost it's almost vital that it needs to change. We, we cannot continue to do the same thing we've been doing in the new macro environment that we're in post pandemic. Uh, and we're still on the tail end of it, obviously, and I hope you're all doing okay. Uh, but things are starting to open back up, but people have changed. Consumption has changed, behavior has changed, and hopefully we can provide the user experience that can provide that change can, that can get people to continue to come back to our brand and feel like they have a place they belong to. And they're not just kind of surfing the net or, or playing content tourist, but they're actually in our communities now. It's the difference between you know staying at a hotel at a place for two days versus I'm gonna rent an Airbnb out for three months and live there. The experience is totally different. And what you do and the feelings you take away and the, the, the things you share about that are completely different as well. And again, this is why community is important and it's important to understand experience too. So let's move on to uh, Matt, the operating conditions. Yeah, actually, oh, go ahead. Pat, if I can be uh, opportunistic, uh, pull yourself back on. Um, that last point is super critical and even lends itself to a third transformation, which is you as the creator in your transformation. Those first two yeah. are really focusing on you know, your students, your audience members, your community members, but equally, especially when we're embracing these community experiences and com uh, community building uh, methodologies, your ability to learn your feedback loops with other people that care enough to tell you something and tell you something honestly is profound and faster, um, a lot faster than through like just the pure audience building channels. Maybe someone will DM you on Twitter or something like that, and that's great. Mm -hmm. But to be able to have a smaller, potentially more trustworthy group of people that care so much about you, especially if you have a paid community like ours that are actually then investing into this experience, then like what we have seen, and we know this from our, our own, uh, I guess, two-year endeavor here with community building through SPI Pro, is our ability to learn about like where really, where are the future needs of our students and our members uh, in a more you know, nano way in a smaller way. And sometimes these smaller little details are just so magical and so important. Like they're, they're, they lead to bigger unlocks. So please, if you're thinking about yourself building a community, don't discount the transformation, uh, the positive transformation that you yourself can go through if you choose to you know, uh, invest in this, in this endeavor. Hmm. So um, huge. As you Thank go you. down that road and Pat, thanks for the tip here for number four, is that then how you operate your creator-based business is going to be different. If you really start to flex into community building, you know, there's going to be different considerations, pro con choices, return on investment considerations, you know, and this is all, yeah, on the kind of the business -y speak side of the equation. But when you're a creator, and especially if you're a solo creator and you don't have a business partner, you're not maybe at that point yet, you know, uh, don't discount the fact that you're a business person too. So like, how are you going to be able to create a community and not have it fizzle out? Uh, to create a community that continues to thrive, that continue to live up to whatever promise you know, you know, you've kind of put on top of it. Um, so these are the operating conditions, right? Um, so like for us, uh, you know, what we think about, you know, how you go from, you know, just a solo creator and Paul Jarvis is, is a great creator himself and, and kind of talking about, you know, just being the solo creator and building a company of one. Um, and that's a, it's a phenomenal model and it works. Um, how can you, if you, if you choose to be solo, how can you still build operational capacity 
you know, around yourself to still facilitate community, right? Um, so choices there around staffing, you know, are there VAs, maybe more than VAs, are there really experienced, you know, community professionals out there that you can explore and try to contact and bring in potentially even on a fractional basis, which is just a term meaning like not full time. Um, and then depending on your success with community, if that's something that you really want to keep enriching and growing and maybe down the road, say as a hypothetical, you started with a free community and then down the road, you're going to launch a premium community that does have a membership, um, kind of component to it, or maybe even several, you know, different price points, you know, sort of a thing. Um, you know, how, how do you get other you know, personnel involved to kind of help you grow that? Cause, cause it is a lot and, and it is if this hasn't maybe been, um, I, I don't know, maybe relevant uh, or hasn't popped up yet kind of in your thinking thus far, is that being able to show up and be you know, just more present in the community, like that is that is a way to be effective, but not necessarily efficient. Like uh, it's, you can't always like automate yourself. You can automate a good bit, but you still have to show up. So, you know, for us, you know, we, we very intentionally build out a CX team uh, that, you know, Jillian leads. Um, we're down the road as we think about our own growth, thinking about, you know, what are other you know, staffing considerations uh, and how does how do those staffing choices uh, influence culture as well? Uh, culture internal to us, you know, the SPI team. And we we care about that arguably more than anything to make sure that we have a, a really fantastic workplace. People love the work we do. They're supported. They have the resources they need, you know, et cetera. You don't per se need to rush out and start hiring people full time. Uh, and, and in fact, that's probably not advisable in, in the early stages, but start thinking ahead. You know, this is a, a very different way of thinking about operating uh, by contrast, uh, an audience based business or one that is uh, potentially more just um, you know, dominated by audience based you know, business decisions. So if you if your business, if you really are just kind of pure company of one and you have a couple of 1099 contractors involved, and that's kind of the model. Um, and again, this isn't like a right or wrong sort of you know conversation point. You know, audience-based businesses like your business uh, model. Yes, as we've explored, it's going to be different. That lends itself to different thinking around staffing culture. Honestly, then is less important because you don't have a team that are employees and different uh, kind of considerations there. You know, to, to necessarily worry about. Um, and you can be even uh, arguably more efficient with audience-based business models. You can automate more. Things can be more programmatic. You can build more automated funnels, for example. Um, but on the com community-based side, yes, you can automate things. But again, like you got to show up. You have to do programming. Jillian will talk a lot later today about the programming that we do within SPI Pro, uh, even within that first 30-day period. Uh, you have to show up and answer questions, especially in that first day or two when new members join. And they're hopefully sharing a little bit about themselves when they when they first join and kind of, you know, hey, um, I'm Matt, I'm, you know, just want to introduce myself to the community. You have to show up authentically. And that's that's real time. You can't really automate or fake that. Right. Um, all of this kind of leads down to that last item there, you know, which is costs. You know, there's always going to be costs in a business. You have to figure out you know, what is the most responsible way to to spend money you know, as a creator on your business. And, you know, people is, is oftentimes and it's true in our business, you know, people is. Uh, or people as a cost, you know, is, is the largest kind of component uh, of our operating model. So, you know, there's always going to be cost, but yeah, how you spend those uh, those dollars are going to be very, very different if you pursue, again, an audience based or primarily audience based business model versus a community more commu more community centric based business model. I mean, you are the operations master, Matt. You helped uh, take my business from kind of scrappy entrepreneur, right, to where it is now and, 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 and the team and all the things. And when it comes to building community, that was something that you were very adamant about. It's like, we can't just like set this up and just like it's good, good to go. Like we have to set expectations for what's gonna be required. And of course, there's different communities at different levels. And of course, if you have a community but you don't have a lot of time, then you wanna make sure you set that expectation that you're not gonna be in there all the time. And that's okay too so long as there's value being uh, sort of provided in there in some way, in which case maybe it is more content centric with some events happening here and there when you can versus our community, which is very much centered around events and connections and masterminds and uh, continual conversations and whatnot. So again, knowing where you're going uh, is really important, but also you could grow into things too. You could start out solo, right, Matt? And then over time, as revenue starts to go up, you can then hire a team member to be in there in the community more so you can do more uh, marketing and more other things like that, right? And so what would be your number one tip for staffing a community? For staffing a community, uh, there are already, and I know it's a bit meta, but like communities out there of 
community professionals. There's CX Hub, which is a great one to go to. So when we were recruiting, uh, and I led the charge on this, you know, from you know the early days, like we didn't have a community team, Pat, right? Mm-hmm. Like this was like, okay, how do we with vision think about what we want to build towards? And then knowing that we're going to need that support structure. So, you know, I wrote out the job description. I had the vision for what I wanted that role to be and then started to network. And you helped with that in terms of like, where can we start to find other pockets of people online that aren't just maybe marketers trying to learn community, but are already community based professionals. And this resulted in Jillian. She was my first hire, you know, uh, full time on onto the community team. But, you know, again, I think to your point or your question, have to hire like full time. There are communities out there of community pros. You can engage. You can find people on contract. Um, you know, uh, it reminds me actually of Seth Godin's uh, community. Obviously, Seth is fantastic. He's super smart and is pioneering of a lot of stuff. He had uh, an alt MBA community. He's done a couple of different things. Akimbo like was another one, mm-hmm. and you know that was even another again kind of pocket of people that you know we were able to kind of get access to and have some conversations with. We invited them into our our recruiting process. Um, and there's great people there. So like, it's being able to like know where to go and start to kind of find these connections, uh, which is a really important factor. Thank you. Uh, th- there is one, if I may, one other thing to kind of draw out there though, and you're, you're sure. starting to talk about around like experiences within the community. Um, it reminds me in that, in this capacity of our, I think mutual friend, uh, Corbett Barr. So years back, he started a community called Fizzle and it, it is a community. It's a membership based thing, but his model, um, was content and I think remains kind of content centric, right? Mm-hmm. So that's a way to kind of find a little bit of a hybrid nature kind of inside the frame of community building where you don't have to staff up huge. There can be more automation there because because the delivery you know, mechanism and, and the value promise is more kind of still self-service. There's content there, right? Yeah. Where ours is very intentional and you and I spent a lot of time talking and debating this on the front end, you know, best way pros, like we chose not to have it be content based. We wanted the experiences, the challenges, the meetups, the special events and all these other things. So right, as you as a right. leader, as you're processing this and going to hopefully take home some, some takeaways, like think that through and kind of understand like, okay, if I make this decision or this other decision, these are the downstream kind of consequences or implications of that. Thank you, Matt. And we specifically chose to go the direction we did because of a lot of the stuff I'm about to share, by the way, quick little check in with everybody. How are we all doing? You getting a lot of value out of here. Give me an emoji in the chat if you happen to be enjoying yourself. Uh, that energy will come back and I'm going to give it back to you. So again, thank you. We're talking a lot of high level stuff about uh, memberships and communities right now, but don't worry because later in the day we have some workshops that are very specific, including the next one with Andy and Alexis about actually how to build a home for your community and examples from other communities and exactly how they do what they do. And then later on this afternoon or evening or maybe morning for some of you on the other side of the world, uh, Jillian will come in and give you the roadmap for your first 30 days after you create your community. And even if you already have a community, it's a great reminder or you might be able to pull some things away from that but the reason why we decided to go in this direction is because specifically the marketing forces are changing and they kind of have changed in in a way you know and i think about how it was when i first started this is back in 2008 um it was all about providing value and content on on our different hubs, right? From the podcast to the uh, blog, and then later on on video and and in books and other things. And it was great because back then, value was having that information and being able to package it in a way that was shareable. And that's still useful. That's still valuable. You could still charge for that, of course. We still do with courses and whatnot. Thank you for all the emojis, by the way. I appreciate that. Ronaldo, Sa- Republic of SaaS, uh, Jen Yi, thank you so much, uh, Anmoy. Um, But lately, as many of us know and have experienced or are experiencing right now, it kind of looks more like uh, like this. It's just like we're getting fed so much content, right? Content, content. And, you know, some of it can be maybe healthy, but maybe most of it isn't. And we are definitely suffering from what I like to call content bloat, where value isn't necessarily just being able to find the content anymore because that content is usually freely available and accessible everywhere, right? I mean, this this plays a role with like, I remember our lead magnets back in the day were these very long eBooks about how to do certain things like email marketing and, and, and create eBooks uh, and all that kind of stuff. And they were 70 pages long and they were getting downloaded like crazy because that information wasn't available anywhere. But now a 70 page eBook as a lead magnet, that's not gonna work because people now have access to that information And value now is how quickly a person can get a result, right? How how quickly can a person transform? How little do I have to learn necessarily in order to get the best result, right? 
And so it's the difference between like, you know, no, no longer is it like the more hours spent or the more content in a course or the more uh, information, the better. This layer of community on top of it gives us the opportunity to uh, not necessarily have to publish as much, but we can connect more, right? And that's, that's really what's key here. So to go back to this, people come for the content and they stay for the community, right? Instead of us all individually hoarding or us as creators being responsible for that, right? Like let's just ram all this content down our audience's throat versus how do we create a setup like this? Nice little picnic. Look at that, I wanna be there. I don't know what event this is, but it looks awesome and I wanna have some juice or whatever is in those red cups. I bet Graham is drinking something different there. I don't know, I don't know. Anyway, the big question I have for you is, well, who's stepping up in your community in your niche to create these communities, right? And so what if you just set up the tent? What if you just set up the tables? What if you did bring some food and it was laid out for everybody, but that's not necessarily what it was about, right? Do you see the sort of difference here? Now you have the nice chairs and maybe you can upgrade to the comfy chairs later, but you at least have a space because people want this sense of belonging to feel like they're a part of something and to meet other people like them, right? That's what we need to do here. Now we created an event uh, in 2019. It was called FlynnCon. It was in San Diego and it was for like the super fans in the audience to come in and we had such an amazing time. Many of you who are watching this right now uh, were there. It's actually my wife and I on stage. We were talking about parenting and overcoming fear and whatnot. My daughter riding a bike, my son swimming, very hard things for them to do. Anyway, we're telling these stories. People are in the audience. They're enjoying the show. It's great. But you know what else we heard after when we were running surveys? The best parts were the conversations I had with people in between sessions in the foyer. And it makes me wonder as like a event coordinator, it's like, if that's the best part, why don't we just lean into that, right? And I knew that was the best part or going to be very valuable because having attended a lot of events, speaking at a lot of events, those were always the moments that I remember, right? And the friendships that were made were not made while somebody was talking on stage. They were made after somebody was speaking on stage or while in the hallway or while at dinner or while at lunch or getting coffee or whatever, right? So. That's what our online communities are able to offer is that those, those hallway moments in between those little sessions and the content. I'm not saying like don't provide content. Obviously, you have to provide content and you have to build your audience. But people crave now not more food. People are craving connection, right? And here's an example. This is literally a conversation that was happening. People conversing who would have never been able to converse together like this before. And this was at our event. This is in the foyer. It was literally happening right before our eyes. So something crazy happened and we all know it did. 2020 happened and it was kind of a, a, a crazy situation. And in 2020, you know, everybody was in isolation and many people began to feel lonely, to begin to feel maybe even a little bit lost. Um, I know that there's many people here, April, for example, and, and, and perhaps Kathy's here and others uh, who were a part of the income stream. I went live every day to uh, not just like provide value every day on YouTube, but to actually bring people together. And a lot of those people are now friends and they have their own Slack groups and they're all chatting now because I was able to come in and facilitate a place for them to connect. But beyond just that point, 2020 was tough and 2021 was also tough because it was like, why aren't we out of this yet? And here we are in 2022, things are beginning to open up again, but the marketing forces have changed and people have changed. You remember Clubhouse? This was a direct uh, reaction to the fact that everybody was just craving connection. And clubhouses since maybe died down uh, quite a bit from where they were, but when everybody was at home and craving connection, everybody was on clubhouse. And clubhouse is still amazing. Go check out April Roga, by the way, she's awesome. And uh, she, she's on clubhouse, she's a masterful uh, clubhouse uh, host. And I, 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 you could still build an amazing audience there too. But this was a direct reaction to the moment that we were in at that time. Because again, people were craving and that changed the way the market was looking at things. Circle coming out. I mean, they were kind of already in development, but it was kind of good timing. And then we latched onto Cir uh, Circle because something that we had once planned to come out maybe 2022, 2023, we pulled forward and it became SPI Pro, right? And SPI Pro was just this awesome thing, this force that became the conversations in the hallway that were happening during that three-day event, but now they're able to happen all the time, right? And it's just been really amazing to see, again, the feedback that's been coming from people with this and also what we've been able to learn. And what was interesting, and this ties to something you said earlier, Matt, is that, you know, we, um, let's see, oh, there I am. We run a survey 
before creating SPI Pro. You know, we had the benefit of having a rather large audience and asking them what they might need. You don't have to have a large audience. You, you do, and we will talk about the requirements of audience before community uh, near the end here. But we asked our audience, well, what would you want in a community? And we gave them multiple options from content to all these other things. Here is the most interesting result. Only 5% of those people who we surveyed wanted more content. Thus, proving the case that content is not necessarily what people wanted more of, at least in our community, and we sense this in the world as well. People wanted more connection. People want to belong again, but somebody needs to step up in your niche to do this and offer that space. And this is why I think communities right now are just a perfect opportunity for all of us as creators, whether you're just starting out or you've been doing this for a while and you have an audience, to mobilize that audience or that soon to come audience in a way that allows you to have much more longevity, which honestly probably should have been around earlier. I mean, we should have been creating communities a lot earlier in this fashion. We just didn't have the tools like Circle uh, necessarily to do it. Um, but it's just been amazing to see what has happened since. And I believe, and I truly believe this, Matt, I love your stance on this too. But it's almost to a point now where if you're not building community in addition to building your audience, you are you're playing a dangerous game because marketing forces will always continue to change. But I feel like community, when you go back to like caveman, cavewoman days, like that's like inherently human. And that will always stick around no matter what happens with technology, whether it's in person, whether it's in a circle community, whether it's in the metaverse connecting and community is going to be really key, right? I agree. Um, one of my phrases is that community is constant, you know, mm. regardless of the content, what we're teaching, you know, teaching practices change um, over time, like, you know, what's in vogue or, or best practice, even in podcasting or email marketing, you know, that stuff evolves and changes. Uh, but you, to your point, even just about like, you know, human evolution, you know, the, the need for belonging for uh, safety and collaboration in a group, right? Like that's constant community is constant. And maybe now finally, like the internet and the capabilities of the internet have caught up to truly being able to foster community in the way that, you know, folks like us that are creators have been, you know, seeking for, you know, a while. And we have attempted to, to architect community and facilitate community in different ways. Uh, and try to bring a lot of those offline, you know, real world uh, abilities, you know, into the digital arena. And now we can, you know, more so than ever. And, and in a way that if we maybe juxtapose that with like, um, I, I suppose, social media, so it's like public networking. So Twitter, even Facebook, stuff like that. Like, right. this is this is not what we're talking about. Like, this is this is not like public networking in the social square of Facebook. You know, this is private, it's safe, it's protected. And, you know, because of platforms like Circle, you know, gives you an ability to have all access to then your community data, which mm -hmm. I guess mm -hmm. is maybe an adjacent point. But, you know, as we think uh, as creators, as entrepreneurs, you know, uh, a whole other conversation path, not to kind of go sideways on you, Pat, is, you know, like all these other mega platforms, like we, we worry as creators about like, do we control our data? You know, uh, do we have access to that? And you even think about Amazon and selling books through KDP, right? You know, you're really limited. But, you know, that's where we have found immense value is that we can not only build community, but we can see community. We can see the data. We can see how people are interacting, what they're interacting with, maybe what they're not. So it's a bit of a maybe tangential point, but I think that's really important also. No, it's 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 definitely the right conversation to have for sure, especially as, like you said, these social media platforms out there, a lot of people are leaving them, right? People are leaving Facebook because it's just become toxic and it's not become a place where really they want to find their people, they're just finding a bunch of loud people, perhaps, and really getting kind of, you know, disturbed uh, about that. Whereas as a creator using a platform like Circle, what's really neat about Circle is it's, it, it's sort of like a, you know, you have customization options, so you can, can kind of build it the way you want. And like you said, you have access to not just data, um, and by data, it's like, who is it that's in your community and how often are they logging in so that you can, you know, make sure that they're, you know, being taken care of, et cetera, who are your, your power users, whatnot. But more so, it's just this idea that um, you can create that experience, right? We cannot control a person's experience on Facebook. We can control perhaps the micro experience that they have in a Facebook group, but maybe even then, maybe not. Because one day they could just start to insert a whole bunch of ads in there. And again, now it's it's for a different purpose than serving our community. It's so that Facebook 
or Meta can make money or, or what name platform here, right? So to finish off this conversation, I wanna get into the decisions that we have to make. And Matt, I'll let you lead this because this is really important. But when it comes to you know the decisions, the hard decisions perhaps that we have to make at this point, you know, it's different. The the decisions as a um, a person who is, uh, you know, building audiences versus building communities. So where do you want to go from here? I think maybe this is the first question we want to answer, which is Absolutely. the decision, do, so, do we need to build an audience? And and the answer to this first question is unequivocally yes. You know, it, it is, it, it has been table stakes on the internet for obviously a good while now, will continue to, to be table stakes. If you're signing up to be a creator and, and that's amazing, well, yeah, you, you have to put in the work and you have to pursue audience building. You have to learn those methods and, and use those technologies and you know, hopefully connect with other creators and you know, especially if you're early stages, like that's that's a part of the path. But there are more decisions to make. And and this isn't then to suggest you know that these decisions are binary, right? That a lot of this is like, okay, how do you make different decisions and then how do you stack your mm-hmm. decisions in a way that is hopefully consistent with your vision, with your passion, what you want to teach, and the outcomes uh, you know that you're pursuing, not just for yourself, but definitely your students, you know, and your community members. So beyond just the, the need to, to build an audience and where, uh, which I suppose is another like finessing decision, you know, uh, are you best on camera? Uh, and YouTube is maybe uh, the right place to build an audience versus podcasting. Um, and Pat, you could pop back on to this point. But, you know, uh, I think it's, it's generally good practice to not try to be everywhere too early in terms of building audience. Maybe try to build like one really strong beachhead on podcasting or YouTube or even social or TikTok kind of, you know, and then be able to kind of grow uh, from there. Um, but yeah, maybe Pat, I'll pull you back in even on that yeah. one point. And perhaps you might want to reconnect your AirPods uh, a little bit. They're kind of some bumblebees sort of buzzing around the room uh, from your microphone, but it's all good. But yeah, audience, I think you have to be building audiences. Now, I think there's a big thing to think about here when it comes to, well, like how big, right? I think too many of us, like it's similar to the question when I, you know, I train and teach a lot of people who want to start businesses and I'm like, what's your goal? And they go, I want to make a million dollar business. I want seven figure, the the seven figure business because that's, that's the dream, right? And then I always noted that that's usually not true. And so I often go, okay, well, can you write down how much money would you need to live your happiest life right now and have all the things that you would want? Let's line by line, by line write it out. And we begin to realize that, wow, I don't need anywhere near a million dollar business. Why am I even thinking about going that direction? Because the difference between a million dollar business in a 120K per year business or even a $60,000 a year business is totally different. And that differs not just in terms of money and savings and all that kind of stuff and what you charge and who you, you, who you, who you help, but with the community that you might potentially build, right? So how big an audience do you need in, uh, in order to build a community? I mean, there's not a specific answer, but it's not nearly as big as you might think because a community could be five people right, to start out with, and you create these amazing experiences. A community could be 10 people who meet in person once a month and just go running together. A community could then grow from there, or you might just keep it small. I know that there's a lot of very profitable communities who keep it very small because it's more intimate that way. I know a group of writers who teach authors how to write, and they create these massively premium experiences, but they're not opening it up to millions. They don't even want that. They want just the few people who wanna go on these journeys with them and that is a tight knit community as well, and they're making money from that too. So, Matt, you want to come back in, and we'll test your microphone. Yeah, sorry for the uh, the glitch there. Hopefully, this is a lot better. Pat, am I coming through? Okay. Yeah, you're coming through. Okay. Okay, great. So, sorry guys about that, but yeah, to to the point around just like the size of the community. Um, some of the best communities start very, very small, um, and you can even kind of build that into your community experience. Uh, mm-hmm. We do that. We have an application on the front end of SBI Pro. This isn't a community where, honestly, like anyone can get in at any point in time. You can't just put in a credit card and join SBI Pro because we are, we have used that to be deliberate in quality control and making sure that you know we are a right fit for a particular type of creator and entrepreneur at the right moment in, in that person's journey. So yeah, you can start small. We started small. Um, I think of... You know, Josh Hall building his little community. Uh, that's more like a coaching based uh, community. He's doing really well and that's in its early days. Um, but, you know, he's being very deliberate, you know, in that capacity. 
So, you know, there's different ways to think about, yeah, uh, the value of staying small, probably, you know, for a while, learn, kind of get those feedback loops going, and then be able to play forward a lot of those learnings into like the next iteration of your community. Now, let's talk about the idea of the fact that, well, do we need to build community? Is community for everybody? Matt, I'd love for you to speak on this because, chat, we don't want to just do this because everybody else is doing it. I personally think everybody should do it, but you shouldn't do it just because of that. You should do it because of specific reasons, and maybe now is not the time. But for many of us, the, t the right time was is yesterday or today, right? Or today, today for sure. But Matt, can you speak to the need to build a community uh, in, in the current environment we're yeah. in? I do emphatically believe that as a creator, you need to be able to have a community offering somehow, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you need to build a community yourself or that you are the center point that you need to take on some of these other things that, you know, Pat and I, you know, we've explored today around, you know, staffing, maybe needing to build a team. How, how do you uh, moderate that? Uh, a lot of maybe the technology stuff. Um, if you really want to potentially grow into a real authority in your niche though, then yeah, maybe, because if it's not going to be you, then it's going to be someone that's going to do that. Right. But there are some other options. So like, as you just think about partnership opportunities or collaborations, right. Things that already in the creator space, we do, right. We do podcast swaps, you know, we do TikTok swaps and like different things. Is there someone already out there that's maybe, maybe for different reasons, a little better position to build the community? Uh, that's in a similar niche or, or genre topic that you can partner with, you know, uh, and that can open doors to have more creative thinking to more even like business collaboration thinking. So like, I guess the invitation here is to not be so maybe binary to think of like, I need to build community or not. Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, what's the best way that I can approach community as something that I can weave into my brand and into my business. And if there's not something that, you know, again, for different reasons, I'm going to take on fully, who else do I maybe know that I can partner with and do some fun stuff with, you know, in the community space? Exactly. I, I, I want to uh, highlight a few comments here. This one that I'll pop up again from Kimberly. Uh, it's so refreshing to hear grow small instead of the masses saying that it's all about the number of email subscribers and six figure businesses. It's so true. This is a long game though, right? This is a long game. The community building aspect is a long game, but that's important because you want to be around for a long time. You want to build something sustainable and you want to bring something that people can come to and rely on as well. So it is a commitment. I mean, I'm not going to lie. It is a commitment. We talked a little bit about potential staffing requirements, but then also sort of creating the community around what is possible and setting those expectations up front. But do you need a community to win on and succeed online right now? No, definitely not. Obviously, there's many people doing that in courses and books and other things, coaching, uh, software, obviously. These are all other ways to serve your audience. But I think there's an inherent need right now today in the environment that we're in for community. And somebody's got to step up and create that. I mean, if it's not you, it's going to be somebody else most likely, right? So in yeah, addition to this, absolutely. you know, there's a lot of pros and cons that will have to be, you know, weighed uh, personally for you. I mean, not just, you know, we, we, we did a pros and cons sort of situation uh, before we launched and you should do one for, for you as well because your situation is different than ours, right, Matt? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, one evaluation point here, you know, juxtaposed uh, back to like the audience building side is because there's just so much content now and you know, I don't even know the stat anymore around like how many podcasts are launching on average every given day, but it's like wild, right? Is that like, if you launch something on the audience side, like as a, as a content production and it doesn't work, it can kind of fade away and you're, and you're probably not going to hear, you know, too much about it. Right. And that's, I guess, like a good thing if you, if, if you take a risk or you try something new and it doesn't work, like kind of maybe no big deal. Um, on the community side, it's a different equation, right? Because mm -hmm. if you launch community and you're trying to do that, like, you know, to, to kind of mix use the phrase, but like pod fading, right? Like if you, if you launch a community and you do that for three months and maybe you get, you know, a couple dozen people in there and like, it's really impressive. You can't just like fade away. Like the, the commitment and the obligation there to me anyway, like feels, it feels very different, right? Especially but, if you're charging for it. So especially if it's a premium yep. community that, that adds a whole other level of like responsibility and decision making. Definitely. However, if you get 12 people in there, I mean, you have now proven that people in your community want to come together. And yeah. what an amazing uh, um, opportunity that that provides to, uh, with a small group, connect with every single individual, understand what their needs are, understand what they enjoy and the kinds of things that would kind of in a way get them involved in shaping where the community goes. And that's the cool thing about community. It's, 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 it's organic. It is something that with your lead and you, you and your team sort of at the helm um, can 
do with the community and kind of grow together. We've got so much great feedback uh, and constructive feedback from our own people that it is now making the community even better, which then attracts more people in, which allows for more feedback to come in. And again, we're, we're growing slowly as well. You know, we could have easily launched and gone super aggressive and super hard and if it had thousands of people in there, but that changes the vibe of the community. So I would recommend if you're starting out small and you're worried about that, actually, that is your advantage, right? That is absolutely your advantage. We do have a little bit of static noise back, so I don't know what's going on, but that's okay because we're pretty, yeah, on your end, Matt, I'm sorry. It's all good. Uh, but we want to finish up by talking about where SPI is headed specifically and some of the decisions that we're going to make. And then we'll get into some questions and answers. So to finish off here, you know, I think it's important to understand that um, you know we're learning too. We're not the experts, although um, we're grateful that you know having gone full force with community over the past couple of years, we've been seen, especially around the other circle communities, uh, as sort of on the forefront of different things. We do get access to a lot of new tools before they come out, so we can test them and break them and make them better for everybody else, which is fun. Uh, but we are also very creative and Jillian, who you're going to hear speak later, uh, myself, Matt, and, and just everybody on the team, we're always thinking about how can we make the experience better, right? Not just the community better, but the experience that the community has better for sure. Sandy says, I'm glad SPI Pro started slow. It's a good community experience. And that's so true. I mean, again, it would have been completely different and it allows us for more room to make mistakes. It, it allows for more grace from those who are in there because we set those expectations about it being new. And if you're launching, you know, you want to launch with a founders group and uh, Andy and Alexis will get into sort of the mechanics of that. I, I know there were some people asking, when is that going to happen? That's going to happen in two hours from now, essentially at noon Pacific, 3 p.m. Eastern. And then at 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern, you'll hear from Jillian as far as like a plan, a roadmap for your first 30 days. But Matt, um, pending any bees, in the room, how are we looking as far as SPI in the future and what community means to us? Yeah, hopefully I'm coming through. I'm on, I think, my fourth mic adjustment. <laughs> okay, bees are gone. What's happening? You're good. You're bees good. Go, go. <laughs> All right. Gosh, I freaking hate that uh, tech glitch. Anyway, the future, my goodness, it's exciting, guys. Uh, you'll hear a little bit more about this um, in even some of our, our post event stuff. Uh, but we are launching new tiers this uh, this year. So right now we have just uh, the one membership tier for SPI Pro, which has done phenomenally well. Uh, credit to Jillian, credit Pat to you and the entire team for just showing up and really delivering and, and I think exceeding on a lot of expectations that we've set there. But now it's the time, two years in, oh my gosh, two years, you know, uh, when we get to that June, July timeframe uh, from when we had launched SPI Pro, it's like, okay, we've heard and learned so much, where can we go? So uh, we're doing two things. Uh, we're actually going kind of upstream. Uh, we're going to offer more like business oriented uh, caliber kind of community. Uh, and we're going to offer uh, a more entry level uh, membership option, more on just uh, education, learning, feedback cycles, uh, but still again, with, with the heart and soul kind of, of community. So that's coming soon. Um, and through us uh, and here at CX Day, and again, this will be shared, I'll think a little bit more about Jillian and some of our, our after event uh, content. Uh, we're actually going to uh, announce here that the uh, what we're calling the learner community um, will be an option uh, if anyone's interested uh, to kind of explore that. Um, so we'll be launching that on the back end of, of this event. So stay tuned for more details on that. Awesome. Thank you, Matt. Um, we have some questions coming in already, which is fantastic. Feel free to start asking your questions because we're going to dive right into that. But we do want to talk about a couple things. Uh, first of all, what's coming next? So let's go over here and talk about the workshop that's coming uh, at noon. So again, there's breaks in between each, a good amount of, uh, of time so we can decompress, we can like get stuff done, but then come back in full force. And we're gonna come back. There's a new link, it's not the same link, but you'll see the link in the description below as well. And likely you have an email with that link as well for workshop number two. And that's gonna be led by Andy and Alexis from Circle, how to easily set up a home for your community, a look behind the scenes at the most popular community setups on Circle. I'm really interested in that because I know that we're always like in our SPI Pro hole. And I also love looking at other communities to kind of get inspired by them and also maybe borrow some ideas that we can implement. And that's the cool thing about Circle itself. The just the, the community of people who use Circle are very uh, friendly and excited to help each other out because we all know that we're all trying to benefit our own uh, users in, in, in that way, which is really cool. So um, that's coming up. And then after that, workshop number three. And that's again, a few hours from now. Uh, 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern. That's definitely one that you don't want to miss with our very own Jillian uh, talking about a CX strategy for your first 30 days. 
So let me mark some of these questions that are coming in and we can chat also about uh, a special offer. Now we're not gonna go too hard onto this, but we do want to reward you for being here and offer you something special. We do have a bundle available. If you are ready to launch your community, you can go to this website, smartpassiveincome.com slash bundle. And if you sign up for any of the circle plans there, uh, you're gonna get access to about $1,300 worth of bonuses, including um, some stuff that we have that gets into really good detail about how to run your community, some bonus workshops, and some other things there. So again, we're not gonna go too hard on this, but Matt, maybe if you wanna pitch a little bit about what it is that people can get there and expect, you'll hear this throughout the day. But we just, again, wanted to offer you something because many of you are going to be starting your communities and we wanted to give you some bonuses and some things to encourage you to do that. This is actually in collaboration with Circle. So our yes. tremendous thanks uh, to Sid and Andy and Rudy, Alexis, the entire Circle team uh, for contributing to this bundle. This isn't just an SPI bundle. It is a collaborative effort. Uh, when you go to that link, you'll actually find that uh, the information page is on the Circle website. So when you end up there, you have landed in the right spot. So don't get confused. Um, Pat, I, I believe that the actual total value is uh, far uh, higher and north of that thirteen hundred dollar figure, but I'll, I'll let oh, folks. Oh, twenty five hundred you know, says Alexis. Yeah, my bad. I kind of go go through that uh, on the page. Um, from our side, um, we are offering, among other things, you know, two live workshops, or I'm sorry, one live workshop and one uh, pre recorded workshop uh, to folks that that sign up. All about community, community building. Um, one of them, Pat, is our our phenomenal open circle event from uh, a little bit ago. Uh, but the live one will be with you and me and Jillian and, and the team here. Uh, I believe that's scheduled for early April. So that's coming up. Um, and we also, because we want to continue to teach and share the effective stuff that, that we have built and learned ourselves, uh, a lot of our bundles actually like usable resources. Mm -hmm. So checklists and, and um, you know, tool sets and swipe copy. So a lot of stuff that if you, yeah, are very eager to begin building your own community and want sort of a, a fast on-ramp, you know, to that and you don't have to like reinvent the wheel uh, and you want to maybe do that in a way that sort of like the SPI way of doing it. Yeah, we put a lot into the bundle. Awesome. Thank you. And then Alexis from Circle, who's in the chat with us right now, as well as Andy, uh, they said that if you already have Circle, go to the bundle page, you'll see instructions for how to redeem those bonuses. So just the fact that you're here, you already get access to those bonuses as well. We don't want to uh, penalize you for, for acting early. In fact, we want to reward you for that. So there we go. Uh, Excellent. And again, if you have circle specific questions coming in, I would recommend you save those for Andy and Alexis specifically, because we're going to dive into some questions right now, Matt, if you are ready. And we'll go for maybe 15 minutes and then we have an hour and a half break till the next one. Also, I Love hope it. that uh, you're all having a great experience here. We're using a um, platform called Ecamm Live. Big shout out to them. I'm enjoying that. Uh, and then also um, just again for Circle and uh, our team for being in the chat and, and for you for taking the time out today, because this is really great. The live link that you're at right now will be the same as the replay link it just it's on that this is the benefit of youtube it automates a lot of that so immediately you you will have access to the replay and again we'll send reminder links and all that all that kind of stuff out for you later but uh let's go into some questions so we got a question from one of our very own members in fact brenda and she says any recommendations on how to forecast the sustainability of a community to determine how and when to make the leap matt i'll let you take this because she mentioned one of your favorite words forecast uh, yes. So why don't you take this one? Well, shout out to Brenda. She's amazing. Thank you for being here, Brenda. Uh, so I do presume maybe as background to the question that you're thinking about a premium community. So one that has Probably, dollars yeah. involved. Yeah. So, so um, you have one tier or maybe several. So, you know, and from a, I guess, a forecasting standpoint from the get go, uh, I'll maybe hard, I just assume it's maybe one tier, one price point. Uh, you know, Think about like a SaaS product, uh, including Circle, right? Kind of conventional pricing mechanics that a lot of people are now very familiar with, almost subconsciously is like, okay, there's a there's a monthly option and there's an annual option. If I choose to go annual, I get a savings. So first I would start there, kind of find your anchor point around like, okay, what do you think the mark, your little market can bear? Um, potentially research that uh, across like other sim potentially similar community offerings and choose your, your monthly price point and then figure out what uh, you might be willing to do on an annual price point um, as a starting point. And this is what we use as well. It's a, around two months uh, free if you if you go annual. So you know, for us right now, um, our, our monthly uh, price point is $49 a month for our, our existing tier. Um, and we have $490 uh, as a price point if uh, a member chooses to go annual. 
then for forecasting, you want to think about those two different veins differently. So what is the churn you know, ratio that you can predict uh, or begin to forecast on monthly? You know, and that's going to be a different churn ratio than on annual because it occurs far, far less frequently, um, et cetera. So you know, at the get-go, a lot of this is just like you have to make some calibrated assumptions and you know, maybe be conservative in your thinking about like how many people might churn out. Um, and calibrate that thinking even uh, in terms of your promotion. So like Pat, when we did ours, right, it was a little more exclusive. We didn't go really public. We didn't run ads or, you know, do any of that sort of stuff. It was more like an internal quiet launch. Mm -hmm. And then again, also we had the application on the front end and other factors that kind of played into it. So we knew, uh, at least I, I knew, I did the forecasting that like, man, if we could hit our, our goal of 500 users when we launched SPI Pro, those folks that got the invites that took the action that signed up and became members, they were going to be probably really committed. Right. And we proud to say, well, like we hit that goal and our, and our churn has stayed relatively low, like single digit low, which is phenomenal. Like it's overperforming general averages. Um, so like, that's kind of the thinking that you might want to do at least from the front end when you go into launching a community. Mm -hmm. uh, but one step further, if I may, if you do get your community up and running, chances are that you have, stripe under the hood to be your payment processor that's what we do there are tools out there such as bear metrics uh, if you want to consider that that help you with this analysis so when you have actual members paying you actual dollars you can look for a tool like bear metrics it's bearmetrics.com and it kind of sits on top of stripe it looks at your stripe data and it does a lot of the financial analysis for you and well there's even at least specific to bear metrics there is a feature of it, which is called forecast. So it will start to show you based on your historical churn uh, numbers, like what that kind of looks like into the future uh, as a projection. So maybe a, a bit of a big answer there, but um, that's that's how we do it. No, you're good. Thank you. And thank you for that question, uh, Brenda. There is a really good comment from Eric here. This isn't necessarily a question, but I just wanted to read it. Fantastic job, Matt and Pat. Thank you. Really appreciate the thoughtful points about audience versus community. This will help me convince the leaders of our community to invest and get involved with Circle. Thanks. You're welcome. Uh, that just makes me so happy because this is why we're here again. Um, you can grab the bundle if you want. Maybe it's not the right time. I don't know. But we are here to provide value always. Um, and that, that's I'm just so excited to hear that, Eric. Thank you. Uh, Richard here is asking, how many platforms did you look at before deciding on Circle? You know, I personally have been very familiar with a lot of community platforms. I even interviewed uh, the, the the founder and CEO of, of um, Mighty Networks, uh, formerly known as Ning. Uh, there were several others that popped up, even ones that our friends have used, like Member Mouse and, and whatnot. Uh, but I do have to say that it was largely due to the fact that the team at Circle started Circle uh, having left Teachable to fill in that gap of community. Uh, they were formal, uh, former, uh, Sid and Andy were former Teachable uh, employees who just saw this hole and wanted to go in and fill it like so, so good. And they have, and just the, the like, we took a risk, right? I mean, it was a brand new company. We were like, okay, we're going to build a business using Circle and it's not fully fledged out yet. But since then they've implemented and implemented fast and are continuing to create some amazing things. And they'll share a lot of that stuff with you in our uh, sort of noon Pacific, 3 PM Eastern talk. But, um, we did, we did some research, but again, it was just very clear that with where they were headed, that they were going to have the tools and resources we needed. And what impressed me the most was not from a creator standpoint, how easy it was to set up and use, but from a user standpoint, a member standpoint, how intuitive it was. Uh, just it kind of is like a marriage between Slack and Facebook groups, I, I often say, um, but just better, right? Uh, so that's kind of how I kind of helped to stir that decision. Matt, I know that you also sort sort of um, were exploring other options too, because we never just kind of just go, well, there's a, a software, let's use it and with it without some research, right? Absolutely. Uh, we checked on all those other options. And to be clear, like those are all good options. Um, so experience, again, is probably the magic word. So as you want to you know, deliberately think about what sort of experience do you want to provide to your, uh, you know, your members, like, yeah, evaluate, like a, a lot of creators even try to build and, and do build, you know, private communities right on top of discord or slack. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, we are hardcore slack users just for the company. Um, but yeah, for, for what we wanted to provide in terms of the experience, as well as the vision, you know, from the, even the early days of SPI pro, it's like, okay, like we believe in then the vision that circle was expressing a ton of overlap. Um, I had a chance to even meet with Sid and Andy, uh, which is a, a weird memory in February of 2020 in New York, they had like, I don't know, just started a few months in 
And obviously that was like, you know, just weeks away from the whole world shutting down. But yeah, that's when the decision was made and kind of just talking with them in person about, you know, what they wanted to accomplish, you know, down the road and what we did. And it was just like, this is such a no brainer. Yeah. Awesome. Here's a question from uh, Bastian who says, would you recommend to gather a couple of people before opening the gates for all or making it open for even the first interested member? Uh, this is a great question that goes into sort of the launch process of a community. And what I recommend doing, I mean, uh, is what I like to call even like an alpha launch. We kind of did something similar. We brought a tiny group of people in um, for, I mean, I, it was like a dozen maybe. Um, and it could even just be a couple. I know some people creating communities who just want a few people in there to start filling in some of the conversation areas so that when the beta launch happens, remember alpha launch, just like literally a couple people who know there's nothing there, right? That expectation is there up front. If you were to do a public launch for the first time without anybody in there, the first people in there are gonna have the worst experience, right? And you don't want that. You wanna reward those people who are there first because uh, you, you don't want it to be a ghost town that then now has to be populated. You want it to be populated beforehand. So some expectation for some maybe super users or some super fans in your audience or some really, really engaged people to come in and be a part of that and to almost kind of like break things and also recommend what isn't working and, and all that kind of stuff. Again, with the expectation that that's probably gonna happen, makes them happy. Maybe you give them a special deal or price to get in or some months for free, whatever. And then you can do a beta launch where it's a controlled, perhaps it's capped, with a certain number of people, or it's a certain limited time to get access, and then it's closed, and then what you're doing with the larger group, the beta group, or the founders group, I wouldn't actually call it a beta group, I think we called it a founders group, and actually founders in group. Circle, we have every person who is a founding member, a little tag next to their name, so we are always reminded that they are a founding member, like a little badge, which is really cool. In fact, every cohort that comes in, because we let people in quarterly, by the way, spapro.com if you wanna apply, um, has their tag and their sort of like initiation date sort of there, which is really neat. Uh, and that's also a fun way to find people, like people who just come in can see that somebody else was a founder and go like, hey, what was your experience really like here? And then, you know, all, all that kind of stuff happens under the hood and in direct messages. And like, w like w we don't see those direct messages, but they're happening and, and people talk about it. Anyway, um, yes, a few users to get in to help break it in an alpha launch, a beta launch that's more of a founder's launch, controlled first users kind of thing fill it out, make it great, break it some more, and then you can go public and wide and either choose to uh, open and close it like we do with applications or just always keep it open. And there's pros and cons to each of those situations, but we chose to go application. Um, Matt, any further uh, conversation about this? Excellent points. I would just maybe emphasize a little bit more the cohorting uh, uh, quality and not just from like your first launch. So something that we learned pretty quickly was uh, trying to do this monthly, that was our original kind of game plan, uh, was challenging for operational reasons. Uh, mm -hmm. It was also not the best experience. It wasn't bad, but it wasn't ultimately in our judgment, the better experience that we could provide if we shifted to quarterly enrollments uh, into these cohorts. Uh, so with Circle, you, know, you mentioned that our, our founding members and that like little visual tag, but then every subsequent enrollment period, every cycle, Mm -hmm. they get their own tag. So then they can find each other. So if you think about if you went to university or any sort of like maybe, you know, trade association or something, right. And you kind of enroll or like, I don't know, like I was a Cub Scout, Cub Scout, I forget, Pat, if you were a Cub Scout, but like, if you think back to that and you're like, get badges together, like with your group, like there is, there's that like more, um, my, like more micro level tribe or, or group, right. That you kind of go through together with. And that just right. adds to this enrichment of like, oh, like I belong and I have my people and we kind of are in this together. So that's just another kind of cool thing to think about. You don't have to do that, but it, we have chosen to do that and actually been uh, quite successful. Yeah, I'm thinking back to like, and by the way, there's a lot of people in the middle of their alpha launch right now. And also just a little announcement, oh, wow. if, if you are already a user of Circle and you want the bundle, it'll apparently be automatically applied to your account when you log in after the event's over or sometime after the event. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll give you some correspondence to that and, and, and confirm, but um, that's pretty cool. It'll just kind of happen automatically. And so again, if you get in the bundle, which is available right here, smartpassiveincome.com slash bundle and choose any plan, you get access to over $2,500 worth of bonuses. Um, I'm thinking back to like college. Maybe in college, I didn't want a sign on me that said freshman uh, unless I was around <laughs> like, the, like the band, honestly, like the band was like a, its own little private community within the larger university community. And that's where I wanted to be known because that's where then the senior level people would then support 
right? And that's the cool thing about the things that can happen is now it's not just like you helping your community, it's your community helping each other, which is really fantastic. Uh, here's a question from Laura who says, how do you manage people in the SPI Pro community selling within the community? Are people allowed to self-promote, sell in the community? This is a great question and Jillian's gonna have a lot to say about this um, on the uh, final workshop of the day, I'm sure, as far as managing people, but you definitely have to address this upfront, right? There are community guidelines that you can create. We have a lot of guidance on that as well, but within there, you have specific rules, essentially, and you can have it so that during onboarding, people see these things and they can't miss it, right? There's like a checklist of items, and again, Jillian's gonna give you the sort of rundown on what to do in the first 30 days, especially important in the first 30 minutes after they sort of sign up, right? Uh, but to control this, the thing that I found has been most helpful is not say, no, you can't sell, because that just almost seems too controlling, and it's like, oh, we're, we're just back to Facebook now. We don't want that. But what we love to do is to set specific spaces for the ability for a person to go in and, and like sell their thing, right? Here is a particular place where that is allowed, and you can do that. Or it might be selling Saturday. Hey, everybody. As you know, you're not supposed to really promote your own stuff here, but it's selling Saturday, so go crazy. Here's a thread that you can start uh, just promoting your stuff and talking about what you're working on. So that way we sort of control that, right? And and I don't know, Matt, if you have any further things about that, but um, you know, ma ma maybe you could talk about like how to handle, what if somebody does break something like a community guideline, like maybe the best way to handle just to kind of further that experience for, for, for yeah. people who are listening. You your advice there is spot on. Um, people will want, uh, even if maybe they don't know it up front, like a release valve. So like give them one, right? Rather than trying to say like no and, and try to, I don't know, some help police like 100% compliance mm. to that. Cause mm -hmm. that's, that, that's when like you kind of create a negative condition or a negative experience. And again, this is all about community experience design. How do you design experiences for your community? So set yourself up for success and them for success by giving them an outlet, right? Give them a release valve. Um, but when it does happen, uh, Pat, to, to the next point, and it might uh, still, <laughs> oh, it might, it probably will, especially at some degree of scale. Um, <laughs> we certainly do have this, uh, like always continue to operate with positive intent. So don't like put them on blast. Don't like respond necessarily, at least not first, like publicly to their post um, in circle. Like you can DM them and be like, hey, like, just so you know, like, you know, I saw this go up, you know, in this other channel or space. And, you know, that's unfortunately, you know, against our, our policy, right. Or our, uh, you know, our community guidelines. So, you know, like this sounds great. Like your offering sounds wonderful, but you know, you know, I'm going to ask please that you take that post down and then let's rechannel that elsewhere. Right. So again, give them that release valve and kind of redirect them there. Right. Exactly. And Jillian just mentioned in the chat here, which is something that I love that we do is we have our little showcase area where you actually mm -hmm. have a platform to show off what it is that you're doing. And I love that too, because it doesn't become even selly feeling. It just becomes uh, like show and tell and show and teach perhaps is, is maybe the better phrase. Um, and then another thing that we also do that I love is our demo days. I highly recommend all communities do this if you are having people like create something or, 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 or accomplish something in your community. We have a demo day and this happens, I think once a quarter, I think, or, or maybe a little bit more often, but it's actually not demo like demolition. It's demo like demonstration where in the beginning of the quarter, people pledge what it is that they're going to work on and have ready by the end of the quarter when demo day happens. And on demo day, it's a live show and tell. Here's what I said I was going to do. Here's where we ended up. And it's a place where people can not just inspire others, but it's a place, it's, it's almost accountability. Like you said, you're going to do this. I have it timestamped right here in that post. And then boom, you did it and you should be proud of yourself. And what an amazing way to retain people when they know that they're working for several months on something and this is the place where they've claimed to you know, say to do it. So just a little strategy for you and something again that we'll get into when we talk more in depth with Jillian later on about community and these kinds of experiences that we create. So Jillian, I hope I'm not stepping on your toes there. I just wanna get people uh, excited. Uh, we got two more questions, actually three more questions. We're at the hour and a half mark and I don't want us to go too close to the next one because I want us to have a break. I need a break, I need some water and a bio break as well. But let's go to Sage Holistic who says, I am concerned about the amount of content that my community will need to keep things clicking along. So you have a community worried about the content, Matt. How do you respond to a question like this? Uh, I'm, I'm maybe trying to think about that through the lens of is it the content that the creator is going to create or the content that the members themselves are going to end up creating just by Good nature question. of like could the, be both the post the post and comments. Yeah. Um, 
I think what we have found is that there's there's a certain kind of self-management governing aspect of well-built communities that members will support each other's uh, comments and things and that, you know, and, and you can begin to kind of seed this through again, com community posting guidelines and recommendations and things like that. But like, is to be intentional with your posts. And this isn't a place to just like post maybe 12 times a day. That's the volume of that is high. You may not get the help you want in return by way of another member coming and answering really thoughtfully. So there's definitely like this quality versus quantity sort of continuum. And, you know, some of the best communities aren't like, oh my gosh, like massive streams of posts all day long. Right. Yeah. yeah. It's like really thoughtful, well-developed, like questions or needs or responses. And, and that's what we have seen to be actually the most valuable. And then we can even try to harvest and amplify those. That's what Jillian does and other members of our team is to try to just add like more awareness to this, those posts, you know, to other members. So, um, I'd say like holistically, I wouldn't worry too much. Uh, I would think about you know, maybe putting some guidelines, one or two in place, as you think about maybe your guidelines overall for the community to try to say like, hey, you know, really, really encourage all of our members to think about, you know, the quality of the posts and mm -hmm. and and not just, you know, just kind of go crazy with too many. Yeah. So that addresses like the posts that people are creating who are members of the community. But what about content? Mm -hmm. There's different forms of content. Sage is following up here content that we create as community builders. And like we talked about earlier, content may not be the play. It may be just a bonus or a side thing on top of the conversations and the events that are happening. And again, definitely we recommend checking out the rest of the presentations today. Um, the schedule is already in your inbox. Uh, but um, there are opportunities for you to have a cadence of teachings in there. But many people are overloaded with that right now. And actually, I know many people who quit communities that they've joined because there's too much content in there. I don't know about you, but I think that there's just this inherent need to, whenever something pops up, to feel like the need to, especially if I'm paying for it, to to use it or, or, or I'm out, right? It's just like podcasts. If I subscribe to 10 podcasts and then I see them all build up because I haven't gotten to them, I almost feel like overwhelmed, even though like, they're free and they're it just I have this inherent feeling that like I'm behind because of that. So content, maybe instead of a quantitative approach, you take a qualitative approach right. where it's only at certain times. Like imagine you only had one call per month in this community. It doesn't sound like a lot. But what if it was the most valuable, amazing two hours that you could ever offer somebody? Do you think that that would be more valuable than a post a day? Oh, mass, absolutely, because now you're cognizant of a person's consumption behavior and you're respectful to their time as well. And it's not necessarily about how much content you share, it's what can that content do for them, right? And arguably, at least in, in I guess our vision and approach to community, our content are the events and the programming. It's not, it's not like written content, it's not content that again, like a blog post or a podcast episode is like done in advance and then you, and then you publish it, you know, it is organizing events or like your demo day reference. Like that's our version sort of kind of right. Like of content in the community. Nice. Uh, some great questions coming in, Matt, you down to hang out with me for five, 10 more minutes. Oh, gotcha. Okay. I just mm -hmm. want to make sure we're, we're here for everybody. And again, we'll be back in the chat. It'll be hosted by others. I'll be here as well. Um, but uh, we'll be back in the chat later to, to answer more questions too. But we got Diane who says, we'll be adding our program cohorts into our circle as an added benefit. Do you have any best practices on these private space groups? So imagine you have a community, but you also have a higher level course where there's a lot more touch points. How do you integrate a cohort based group of students, for example, into an existing membership uh, circle platform? How might, how might one best do that, Matt? There's the number one, the tagging component. So you, you can start to, you know, isolate almost from, again, like a data standpoint, mm -hmm. uh, tag people with uh, different cohort labels. Uh, you can have fun with that. You could use colors, you could use, you know, symbols of some kind, you can use emoji. Um, we even have in our community masterminds, uh, which is sort of like an, an add-on sort of thing. And then the mastermind groups, I think, uh, what is it? Everyone uses flowers or, or, or something like you can have fun vegetables with vegetables or something um, or vegetables or something. Um, you know, the, the other thing, you know, and again, thanks to circle is there are, uh, more granular privacy settings that you can throttle for individual space groups. So you can exactly. take a, a space group and, and this is actually the way that we mechanically bring to life the masterminds and then like, okay, this mastermind has eight people in it. 
So this one space group is limited to just those eight people. No one else can see it. Like it's literally invisible. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's, that's, I guess the best way, at least within circle platform and, and it's great. It works, it works fantastically well that we facilitate these more private intentional, like micro level, um, experiences. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, if anybody from circles in the house, can you comment on when people who already have circle might see their bonuses come in? Just wanted to uh, be upfront with that. And I imagine that it's going to come later. Uh, but we shall see, and we'll make sure to, to get it to you um, no matter what. We have your email because you've registered, and if you haven't registered, if you happen to be catching this and you haven't registered uh, to the event so you can get emails and follow-ups and whatnot, you can go to smartpassiveincome.com slash cxday. And then obviously there's the bundle right here at smartpassiveincome.com slash bundle as well. Uh, from Affinity Limited, how would you manage your time spent growing your community when you're a smaller organization or a single individual? Like how much time would you allocate? Uh, Matt, you spoke on this a little bit earlier. Uh, how would you define maybe a specific number of hours to allocate for a smaller organization? Yeah. Uh, for us, and to some degree we're small, but also not, uh, I want to say we put in a deliberate six months, not like full time, but like six months architecting from vision all the way through uh, before launching SPI Pro, um, probably at minimum. So if you are more like solo creator, uh, operator, or again, small team, I'd also kind of think about, you know, a two quarter, six month runway so that you're not overwhelming yourself because there are other priorities and things that are already in flight uh, to think about, again, vision, strategy, outcome, you know, how you're going to measure things, who's going to do what if you have a small team, so you have a couple of people involved, you know, who's going to be responsible for what components of community management, um, et cetera. So, uh, you certainly can go faster. Absolutely. You can have a community out there, you know, in a couple of weeks, uh, yeah. but you know, I, I'm trying to read into the question a bit. So it's a smaller organization, but it's not just maybe one person. Um, you have other things in flight, other priorities, things that are happening in, in the course of the business. So yeah, if you spent like a quarter or two, you know, three months to six months, you can throttle kind of within those goalposts. I think that's a healthy amount of time to get some, um, you know, reflection from members that you trust, maybe you're in a mastermind group or you have other creator friends that might, you know, want to weigh in or you would trust to go to to kind of validate or invalidate some of your thinking. Like, and that's, sorry to maybe um, kind of get lost in some of the detail, but like, that's how I think about the whole process, right? You know, Pat, we do a lot of idea validation, you know, kind of R and D a little bit um, before we really kind of, you know, launch something. So that whole, that whole process before you really maybe want to like launch something, I'd think about like in a three to six month window. Yeah. And then as far as like after you have a community, how much would a time commitment uh, be required to um, keep it running smooth and, and, and keep the party going? Yeah. Uh, Jillian spends a lot of her time in you know SPI Pro, other members of the team, even Mindy, our phenomenal solutions manager, because uh, we get a lot of questions on you know, technology uh, from other creators. And, and she's our solutions manager and just can go gangbusters on that stuff. So you know, a couple hours a week for sure, in terms of like maybe the average person, Jillian spends more. But again, like this is, it's a little bit of a cir circular question where like, what is what is the design of the community? Exactly. You know, how much of that is, is based on events? How much of it is based on not events, but published content, like in sort of all the other kind of considerations. So that's, that's a great way to think about, it. yeah, like if you have a time commitment cap, like I am limited to blank, right? I am limited to, Gosh, I, I only think that I can spend four hours a week, eight hours a week, like doing anything related to community, then mm -hmm. embrace that design constraint and embrace the constraint of like, okay, that's how much time I have. And then make, make community related decisions inside of that constraint. Awesome. Thank you. You mentioned Mindy. Mindy is here too, by the way, in the chat. She says, hello. Hi, Mindy. Uh, shout out to you oh, for hey, all that you do. Um, two quick questions that just came in and we're going to finish up on this. Uh, tips to roll out events with a small group. The no-show rate is a problem. So this is great, and Jillian mm -hmm. will be talking more about this as far as creating events and getting people to show up. But a couple things. You can position it as uh, an event that not necessarily people have to go to to get value from, right? The replay or just the bonus is you're there live, but this is content that's being created for the purpose of having it be part of the library, if you will. And that's a great way to frame it so that you're less focused on how many people show up live. That's just a bonus for people versus um, it's a resource that's going to be in the library. Just people who are there live have the opportunity to ask questions, number one. Number two, making sure that that planning for that event 
and Circle has events that you can kind of have RSVPs for is there and people get notified and they kind of understand that. And plus the last thing with events is you have to sell it. Like what's the purpose of a person taking time out of their day to come just like we sold CX day here for you because this is all obviously important to you and you're still here and we were so grateful for that. Um, you have to sell the events that you're creating. What 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 will a person get out of that? And, um, and the more that you can get people into a routine over time that these events, especially if they're recurring, the more likely they are to just bake it into their schedule and have it be a part of the culture of, of the business and of the, um, of the brand. Uh, and then finally here, a quick one for you, Matt. Juliana says, I think Matt mentioned a site for measuring progress, parametrics or uh, something. Uh, bear metrics. I think someone I saw in the chat responded. B-A-R-E metrics. B-A-R-E metrics.com. Awesome. And don't forget, up next, workshop two starts in about one hour, 20 minutes with Andy and Alexis, how to easily set up a home for your community. Look behind the scenes at the most popular community setups on Circle and then Jillian later this afternoon. Chat, this has been wonderful. Thank you so much, Matt. This was a pleasure, and I'm grateful that the replay is so already fun. available for people as soon as we hit end broadcast. So thank you so much. The link for workshop two is in the description if you want to just open that up now so you're ready in there already. Um, and again, uh, if if uh, I'll get some answers for you as far as like when the bonuses will show up, but I promise you we'll get them to show up, and it might be after the event if you don't have them already. So uh, yeah, there we go. Thank you so much, everybody. Hope you enjoyed and Thanks, everybody. Uh, looking forward to seeing you on the next one. Cheers.